June 21, 2023, Duluth, Minnesota, a gorgeous summer morning, perfect for flying, until a vintage 1946 Aronka champion suddenly plummeted into the woods, killing both men on board, and here's the kicker, the airplane was working fine. No engine failure, no storm, nothing. The real cause? A shockingly simple mistake. The kind of mistake that continues to kill pilots every single year. And the more you look into it, the more frustrating it gets. So, let's break down what actually happened. The pilot, 60-year-old Brian Handyside, had just finished the annual inspection on his little Aronka Champ the day before. He wasn't some rookie. He had around 640 total hours in his logbook. But here's something important. In this particular airplane, he had only about 17 hours. And on the morning of June 21st, he took his buddy, 64-year-old Matthew Joseph, for what looked like a casual local flight. They left Duluth International around 7 a.m., and the plan was simple fly northeast about 18 miles to Handyside's private grass strip. Now, a grass strip is basically a mowed field used as a runway. No lights, no asphalt, just turf. Pilots often like to fly low over their strips to check them before actually landing. That's exactly what Handyside did. According to GPS data, the Champ flew right over the runway at only 100 feet above the ground. That's barely higher than a 10-story building. His ground speed was about 58 miles per hour, which is fine, except instead of continuing on and keeping speed, he started a shallow climb. He reached about 240 feet, but here's the catch. The airplane was bleeding speed. By the time he was up there, it had slowed to around 54 miles per hour. Now, that's dangerously close to stall speed in this airplane, especially when you add in the extra weight and a turn. And sure enough, right after that, Handyside banked left, trying to loop around toward his strip again. In that moment, the airplane simply couldn't keep flying. It stalled, rolled, and dropped nose first into the woods. No chance of recovery. This wasn't just an unlucky break, it was a classic trap, flying too low, too slow, and adding a turn on top of it. A perfect setup for an aerodynamic stall. Here's where it gets really interesting. People think stalls only happen when you're slow and level, like the bottom of the speed gauge says stall. But that's misleading. A stall isn't really about speed. It's about angle of attack. That's the angle between where your wing is pointing and where the wind is actually hitting it. If that angle gets too steep, the smooth airflow over the wing breaks apart, lift disappears, and boom, you're falling. Now when you're banking or carrying extra weight, you increase the wing's workload, and that means the airplane can stall at much higher speeds than you expect. So when Handyside slowed to 54 miles per hour and then rolled into a left turn, he was flying right on the edge. The bank angle pushed his effective stall speed higher than his actual airspeed, and that's the one thing you cannot do at 200 feet above the ground. There's simply no space to fix it. And here's another layer. This was a tail dragger, a little Aronka Champ. Beautiful airplane, but not forgiving. It has just 90 horsepower, very little momentum, and it bleeds energy like crazy in turns. There's no stall horn, no electronic safety net, no guardian angel autopilot system like modern Cirrus aircraft have. It's just you, the wing, and physics. And remember, Handyside worked at Cirrus. So did his passenger. Both men spent their careers surrounded by airplanes with envelope protection, parachutes, and warning systems. Yet, on this flight, they were in a machine that had none of that. If you mismanage speed and angle, it bites immediately. So really, this wasn't about the airplane failing, it was about the physics catching up. Low altitude, low airspeed, a turn, and a tail dragger with no margin for error. A deadly mix. Now, let's talk about the little things that stacked up against this flight, because honestly, that's where the real story is. First, weight. The NTSB calculated that the airplane was about 136 pounds over its maximum gross weight. That's not a trivial detail. The Aronka Champ is a tiny two-seater with a gross weight of just 1,300 pounds. Add fuel, two grown men, maybe a few personal items, and suddenly you're flying beyond the airplane's limits. And what does being overweight actually mean in practice? 
It doesn't mean the airplane just refuses to fly. It means everything gets worse. The climb rate shrinks, the controls feel mushier, and here's the killer. The stall speed goes up. The margin between flying and falling gets thinner. That's the kind of performance penalty that can turn a normal turn at 240 feet into a fatal mistake. But weight was only part of the problem. The pilot's recent flying history raises some red flags too. In the 90 days before the accident, he had logged just 2.3 hours total. And in the last 30 days, zero. Nothing. Now don't get me wrong, 640 total hours isn't bad, but flying is a perishable skill. It's like playing the guitar or shooting free throws. If you put it down for months, you're rusty. And in airplanes like the Champ, which are twitchier than your average trainer, that rust shows fast. And here's the part that really bugs me. This was the first flight after an annual inspection. Now I'm not saying the mechanic did anything wrong. In fact, the NTSB found no mechanical issues at all. But ask any seasoned pilot. After maintenance, you climb to a safe altitude, you stay conservative, you make sure the airplane is healthy before doing anything else. The last thing you do is buzz a grass strip at 100 feet with a passenger on board. That's test flying without a safety net. And honestly, it's extremely frustrating because this was completely avoidable. What we see here is a textbook error chain. Being overweight, rusty, and choosing a risky flight profile didn't cause the accident by themselves, but stack them together and suddenly the window for survival shrinks to nothing. And this is where the story almost feels cruel. Both men, Handyside and Joseph, worked for Cirrus Aircraft in Duluth. Now, if you know anything about Cirrus, you know they build some of the most technologically advanced general aviation airplanes in the world. Full glass cockpits, electronic stability protection that won't even let you stall the airplane, in most cases, and of course, the famous whole airplane parachute system. Cirrus is literally synonymous with safety innovation. But that morning, these two guys weren't flying a Cirrus. They were flying a 1946 Aronka Champ, a bare-bones tail dragger designed in the years right after World War II. It's a charming little airplane, but let's be clear, it has none of the modern safety features. No stall warning horn, no autopilot stability system, no safety parachute. If you screw up the basics, if you let speed bleed off or you bank too steeply, there's nothing there to save you. And there's a psychology angle here too. Pilots are most vulnerable when they feel comfortable. This wasn't some stressful cross country. It wasn't bad weather. It was a short local hop to a private strip on a clear summer morning over familiar ground. That's exactly when pilots tend to relax, get a little distracted, maybe focus on the runway or on the passenger instead of watching airspeed. And when you're low to the ground, that tiny lapse in focus can be the difference between flying and falling. Even the way the crash was discovered underscores how fragile this situation was. Nobody on the ground saw the airplane go in. What actually triggered the search was the ELT, the Emergency Locator Transmitter. The Air Force Rescue Coordination Center in Virginia picked up the signal, passed it to local authorities, and that's how the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office found the wreckage. That's a chilling thought. Without that little beacon, they might not have found the airplane for hours. For me, it really drives home how crucial these safety systems are, even in the simplest old airplanes. So what do we actually learn here? If I had to boil it down, it's this. The airplane didn't kill them. The weather didn't kill them. It was the simple, brutal reality of flying too slow, too low, with no margin for recovery. But there are deeper lessons hiding underneath that. Number one. Stall margins are sacred. Don't mess around near stall speed at low altitudes because if you cross that line, recovery is impossible. Number two, weight matters. Flying overweight isn't just bending the rules. It erodes your safety margins in ways you don't see until it's too late. Number three, recency is more important than big logbook totals. 600 hours doesn't save you if your last few months were spent on the ground. Number four, treat post-maintenance flights like test flights. Go high, stay conservative, and don't put yourself in a corner. And finally, don't let showing off or comfort zones lull you into complacency. Even if it's just a short hop with a friend, you've got to fly disciplined. At the end of the day, this was a fatal reminder that the laws of aerodynamics never take a day off. Two experienced men 
both surrounded by aviation their whole lives, were brought down not by bad luck, but by a simple, unforgiving mistake. And that's what makes it so haunting. Because the truth is, if we're not disciplined, it's a mistake that any one of us could make. 